Greetings YouTube. Today I'm going to be reviewing The Sumerians by C. Leonard Woolley. Now I don't know if any of you have ever heard the term Woolley intellectual, but this book, this author, may be the reason that that, that particular term exists. He's very dry and academic, to a high degree. Um, he gives H.P. Uh, Lovecraft a run for his money for when it comes to large blocks of text. Um, there's one particular paragraph in this book that runs three pages. One paragraph. It's it's really quite astounding. Um, this is falling under the category of archaeology slash history. And amazingly enough, this book, which is in incredible condition, appears to have been printed in 1965. And I believe it because there is no barcode on this. Uh, the only price is the little gold sticker in the corner that says $2.25. Um, it's just in amazing condition. I don't know who owned this before me, but they really kept it in nice shape. I hope they read it because um, while incredibly dry, it was interesting. Now, this was originally printed in 1965, and because of that, it does take a certain tone uh, <laughs> that would probably be considered unacceptable um, by your average uh, reader today. It's, it's a little bit of the white man's burden, you know, coming from the position of, of the European superiority in some ways about uh, history, and uh, a certain kind of arrogance um, to the tone. And I didn't bother me, I, understand. I, was, I was able to keep it in context, and the person wasn't an out and out racist. Uh, but it was, uh, it was prevalent. Now, I actually didn't know a great deal about the Sumerians prior to reading this. I mean, I had a good general idea of the Sumerians. Uh, but I, this book really gets into the details, the founding of the Sumerian people, um, the, the, the nation that evolved around them, uh, how they interacted with uh, the uh, Akkadians to the north and the other races to, 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 to the east and west, because to the south was ocean. And that's important because they were living in an area that was all about floodplains and really great farmland. And it's because of this farmland that you almost have this air of myth about the Sumerian era, about their rich spoils and their wealth, because they had such great land to, to work with, even though they had to you know, adjust the fact that they were essentially living on a floodplain, water full of coming down the rivers every day, um, the Tigris and Euphrates, uh, you know, every year, flooding the plains and but they adapted adopted to, adapted to that just as the Egyptians did and this deals with not only the history as we know it but the history of the peoples themselves and for example they give a chronological listing of kings uh, of the leaders of the of um, their nation and their history and, I, and, it, and it really implies that there's a possibility that a lot of this information was parallel so you could have had kings in different smaller regions within that area being listed but not being shown that you know Bob and Bill were being were both ruling at the same time so you get this disorder that makes it look far deeper than it actually was um, and in fact some of these uh, particular kings were supposed to have ruled for like 1200 1500 years obviously they didn't do that but it very much does fit into the framework of the same kind of Bronze Age thinking and historical um, records that we have from the biblical era, where you're supposed to have had people that lived hundreds of years. Of course, they didn't live hundreds of years. And as it gets closer and closer to our time, the, the lifespans get shorter and shorter and shorter and become much more realistic until you get to the point, okay, yeah, I, this, it tells me it's this guy ruled for six years. I believe he ruled for six years. Um, so I think that was interesting. And I think it gave it a, for me at least, it gave it a sense of, these people really did live in a mythic mode of thought, um, which which was really quite interesting. Because let's face it, the Sumerians were one of the first peoples in the in the world that we know of to have used printed language, and they were using cuneiforms on clay tablets. And they were what's essentially doing they're taking a, a a wooden stylus with a little the tip had been carved into into a shape like a triangle, and they were impressing that, creating different uh, glyphs that would convey something that had never been really done before. 
One of the things I found fascinating about this that I didn't know of is that for really important documents, and these people documented everything, and they documented them on clay tablets, so they survived relatively well. Um, some for the year are really important things. They would take this clay tablet, they would put it inside of a clay envelope, and then mark on the outside of the envelope who witnessed it. And a lot of their law was very much based on witness. Like this person here at this time witnessed this event. And as, as a form of, of confirmation, of a form of um, checks and balances, and of bookkeeping. And, and it really is interesting to see the incipient nature of a code of law being formed in its inception. Um, as I said, it is a little dry, but the history that this book covers is still incredibly riveting. I don't know if anyone has ever done any Sumerian fiction, but based on this book, it would makes me think that you could do something as deep and as interesting as and and as Arthurian or you know uh, Martin's Game of Thrones or Tolkien. You could do something just as deep based on the real world uh, as any of those fictional worlds I just mentioned. And I mean, there's just so much in here that it, and is so cool though the names would probably have to be changed slightly um, for our, your average audience. They're, oh, well, they could use the actual names, but they're going to have to use nicknames, because some of these names are huge and very cumbersome. Um, some of them are very handleable, ones that can be easily hand handled, like Sargon. Sargon, great name, easy to remember, easy to use, but some of them are much more complex than that. Um, and it talks, it, it shows the dynamics of the world, of their world as well. How the Sumerians were on top of the Akkadians, the Akkadians on top of the Sumerians, how how different regions influenced them, how the semantic lang languages uh, was used and how it spread and how over time you began to find more and more semantic names inf infiltrating the Sumerian culture or you could find Sumerian names influencing other cultures. So it really shows the cross-fertilization that was going on in the world at that time. It's not a particularly big book. It is dense in the sense that it's, again, it's, it's kind of dry and it's it's uh, there's a lot going on in here. There are also uh, some uh, photographs, which is a nice touch, and there are if I'm not remember correctly, I haven't read this been a couple months. Yeah, there are illustrations of important uh, thing like this. For example, is a map there of their map a map of how they perceive the world. But there are illustrations of cities and of temples in here, which are also quite interesting. Particularly to me, I'm a I'm a map junkie. I like these kind of things, and I like using historical maps. Um, of this type when it comes to designing adventures for role-playing games. I really like the, the, the fact that it gives it an air of feel of authenticity to me. It, it gives something a sense of place. So, I very much recommend The Sumerians um, by Wooly. If you can get through the density and a little bit of the archaic tone of the book, um, there may be an updated version of this I haven't looked online. Uh, but I think it's well worth your time, and I really think that you should give it a read.